You and I would call it a sponge bath. To pharmacist Mark Foster, it's a sacrament. Last rites. In a few hours, Foster will be dead. The man bathing him is Greg Friesner. He'll be the guy who pulls the trigger. The strange thing is, Mark's murder is his own idea. Yeah, you heard me. This story is, well, unusual. It's a wild yarn of how the mild-mannered guy behind the prescription counter has a secret life. And in that life, he is the leader of his very own voodoo sex cult. Got your attention? Yeah, I thought so. So make yourself comfortable, because, boy, have I got a tale to tell you. My name is Steve Sharippa. I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. I've seen good people turn bad and bad people turn worse. Some took contracts to carry out a hit. Some were victims of a hit. To hitmen, life and death is just part of the business. It's nothing personal. Like many a strange story, Mark Foster starts in an ordinary place. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Trust me, even Minneapolis has a dark underbelly. Minneapolis is, in general, a very good town. However, you never know what's lurking behind the next corner if it's a McDonald's or a voodoo cult. In the history of Minneapolis, you might never find anyone with a weirder secret than Mark Foster's. On the surface, he's a charming local businessman. Nice house, a few kids. Unremarkable, right? Ah, uh, no. Nah. Pay attention, because this story is going to get crazy real quick. My father was a phenomenal character. He was like somebody you'd never ever met in your entire life. He was very off the wall. I loved my dad a lot. Mark and his wife were also standing parents for his nephew, Frank, whose mother died when he was a kid. Frank's not his real name, by the way. He asked us to call him that. I felt very loved by my uncle. He went out of his way to make me feel like I was a very special person and part of his family. He would read my palms and do tarot readings on me and stuff. See what you did. I looked at it more like a joke than anything else. The Fosters fit right into their neighborhood of God-fearing, wholesome people. They worship at the Seventh-day Adventist church. But for Foster, his church doesn't have all the answers. Foster's what you call a seeker. He's always looking for spiritual answers, you know, a path to follow. He doesn't find a truly satisfying one in his church, so he keeps looking. He finds lots of things that intrigue him. Hindu gods, Buddha, Odin, occult beliefs, the spiritual world, fascinates him. Mark was a very spiritual person, or what I would call a very new agey person. He was always into something. I'd come over to his house and he's like, look at this new Buddha statue I bought. I think he was seeking internal knowledge of the universe. I think he just wanted to know everything there was to know about everything. Mark Foster grabs life with both hands. His curiosity about the world is insatiable. He wanted to know about everything and wanted to experiment with everything. He'd get into fly fishing for a couple weeks and he'd buy just thousands of dollars worth of gear and all this fly fishing equipment and he'd fly fish for like two weeks and he'd be done with it and he'd throw it in storage. 
I think that Mark very much was a boy at heart and maybe even <laughs> more than at heart. Everything about him was like, this is just going to be great. It's just going to be wonderful. Being a seeker works for Foster. It gets him out of his small Wisconsin town and into the Air Force. It gets him a pharmacist license and a successful career in the big city. It opens a lot of doors for him. One of those doors takes him to New Orleans. His trip there introduces him to Santeria. It's the spiritual awakening he's been looking for. Santeria is the Cuban version of voodoo. It's not a weird cult of spellcasters and zombie makers like in the movies. It's actually an ancient religion with millions of followers, and its roots are in Africa. Now, to people who believe in Santeria, the line between the spirit world and our world is not hard and fast. It can be crossed. Let's not get this wrong. There are lots of reasons to talk to spirits. Santeria's gods and spirits care about you. They can help you get what you want out of life. My uncle believed in Santeria as a tool, a means to an end. The power that he believed he could get or influence over people, and he believed it with his whole mind and heart. In the world of Santeria, there are about a dozen gods and untold numbers of ancestral spirits. The first step is to discover your own personal Orisha, the god whose path you are meant to follow. For people that are initiated into Santeria, you use different necklaces to find out what your guiding force or Orisha is. My uncle, he had taken on the mindset of, of Eshu, the trickster. Eshu is a hell of a god to follow. Listen, he's no cosmic mischief maker. He's more dangerous. Did Mark Foster pick Eshu or vice versa? In Santeria, it's always a little of both, but it is a good match. For one thing, there's nothing Foster loves more than a trick. Practical jokes are a huge part of his personality. He was a very funny man. He was into shocking everybody. Eshu's no ordinary prank player. He's the god of fortune and misfortune. And speaking of fortune, get on Eshu's good side with a few rituals and thoughtful gifts, and he might just pay you back. Bingo. In the late 80s, a new business frontier is opening. Everybody's got a new computer, but it won't do much. The information superhighway is still a dirt road. Did I mention how spiritually connected pharmacist is also a computer pioneer? When we were growing up, we always had computers in the house, and he would network them before we even knew what networking was, so he was very into the computers. Mark starts a technology company. He calls it Quanta, to exploit the opportunities computers offer. Maybe it's Mark's insatiable curiosity that opens his eyes to a new opportunity. Maybe it's his boundless energy that helps him exploit it. Or maybe it's the gods and spirits he asks for help. One way or another, Mark Foster is about to become very very rich. It looks like Eshu has showed him the right path, but what the gods give, the gods take away. Mark Foster's life will soon be over. His chief disciple, Greg, will be the one who kills him. Mark's nephew, Frank, will be there to help. He decided it was time to die, but he didn't want to do it himself. He wanted somebody else to do it for him.
By 1989, Mark Foster, pharmacist, father, spiritual seeker, Voodoo Initiate is on the cutting edge of modern technology. Mark had a, a lot of inspiration and a lot of good ideas. He understood the principles of business and he was a good salesman. By the end of the 80s, the computer companies have figured out a way to put huge amounts of data on a CD. Foster figures out if he puts loads of free information he gets from the US government on a disc, he can make a tidy profit. What he makes is a fortune. One of Quanta's first products is the CIA World Factbook. It's a US government publication that's basically an atlas. It costs pennies to burn one and sells for $130. When I first started at Quanta, it seemed like the sky's the limit. We had a good product that people hadn't seen before, you know, searchable disks full of information. It seemed like it would keep growing and becoming more successful as time went on. His sudden success opens the door for Mark to show another face, ladies' man. By now, he's ditch wives number one and two he finds number three right in his graphics department. Mark was the ideal boss when you're young and you want to have fun, too. We would go to a movie some days, just let's close down the company today and go to a movie. It was so easy to make money that you didn't really have to be business oriented. You didn't really have to think about the future. In 1993, Vice President Al Gore comes to town to promote the new technologies that will put America back on top. Mark and Quanta are the perfect photo op. Does Gore know who he's really sitting next to? Not a chance. To the world, Foster is the face of high-tech capitalism. It made you feel like we were really going places. It really seemed like a, a huge moment. Mark catches the technology wave and succeeds beyond his wildest dream. He likes to think of himself as the smartest guy in the room. He could grasp anything fast, then move on. He can now check off master of the business universe. But he lets his company coast and dives deeper into voodoo. Mark returns to Solomon, his high priest in New Orleans. It's time to be reborn. For a resurrection to happen, of course, the old Mark must die. It's all symbolic. It turns out Mark wants to be more than a priest. He wants to be a spiritual master. In voodoo, that's a position you have to inherit. You gotta kill the priest who initiated you. It's more symbolic mumbo-jumbo. No shamans are actually harmed. My dad always liked to be number one and the biggest and the grandest of whatever he did. He played the role of the supreme being. And what's a leader without followers? Back in Minneapolis, Mark sets out to recruit some. So he heads to the Magus bookstore, a hangout for spiritualists and other fans of the occult. There he finds 24-year-old Greg Friesner, another seeker. Friesner's fresh out of blooming prairie, Minnesota, where he was raised by his mom, Jackie. He was never shy very outgoing, curious about everything. And once he sinks his teeth into something, that's it. <laughs> He's, he goes for it. Greg's spiritual quest started in a small prairie town, just like Mark's did. He was into the dark music. And I think that's when he started getting into the dark religious beliefs also. We tried to get him to change, but like I said, he was stubborn. And that's, we had a big fight, and that's when he left for Minneapolis. Greg, 
Greg was very impressionable, very hungry for knowledge. He wanted to find a path. He wanted to feel at home somewhere. Greg was reading a book, and then Mark, I think, asked him about the book, or they just started talking about, you know, the occult. I would say he fell under his spell, no pun intended. Greg becomes Foster's first disciple. Voodoo is a religion about nature and different types of gods and learning which god you correlate with. Everyone supposedly holds an energy of a god in them. And you're supposed to discover what path you're on in order to fulfill your life's purpose. He felt that he had fulfilled his life purpose by finding out what god he was to serve or what god actually was to serve him. Yeah, peas in a pod, those two. So with Mark's help, Greg discovers that his personal god is Eshu, that same Arisha as Mark. Eshu, the trickster, the scamp, the one who misleads you to make you wise. At the beginning, it's all fun, of course, but hey, the more the merrier. Mark is on the lookout for other spiritual seekers. His charm and personal magnetism turns them into followers. Mark's gathering more and more initiates, and it's no coincidence that most of them are attractive young women. My uncle had a unique way with words and was able to convince almost anybody of almost anything. He was a very manipulative man. However, most of the time, he really meant well. He would manipulate anybody to accomplish his goals. But in his own mind, his goals were just and proper. He was somebody that people trusted. He built a rapport with people almost instantaneously. You met the guy and you just loved him. Mark's nephew, Frank, his surrogate son is drawn in. At first, my attraction to Santeria was curiosity. And that curiosity was met with some very intense sexual experiences with a number of different women that brought me deeper in. There were so many women coming and going and anybody would do just about anything for you. I began to believe what my uncle was, was teaching. And of course, I looked at him like a father figure, so I had complete trust. If you were adopted into this cult, you were, you were family. Mark Foster, the only man in America who's a voodoo high priest and a high-tech CEO is getting richer by the day. This was a really high-margin business when he started, which is why he called it a cash cow business and took the cow's head logo as the symbol of Quanta. He just had a fetish with bovine art for a while. He really got into the cows for a long time. That's probably the longest thing he held on to was his love of cows. As the cash cow keeps filling his bank accounts, Mark treats his followers to a great time. The business was going like gangbusters, and he was treating his family and friends. He loved limos. Just about every weekend, he was in a limo, driving his friends around. My father was very generous, and the more wealthy he got, the more generous he was. Money didn't really change my dad at all. He was just allowed to buy more expensive things and give more money away to people. He always treated everywhere we went. Just one little problem. As time went on, Mark was, as best as I know, spending more money than what he was taking in. You know, he was more interested in having fun than in managing a company. And as long as the company was doing well, he could have fun and not have to be too concerned about it. 
but the more there was competition in the industry, the more difficult it became. So today, suddenly, we really needed to get something done on whatever front. Uh, our technical manual isn't good enough. Tomorrow, it's something else. It's always, you know, rush to do this, rush to do that. But uh, there was no clear vision, no clear plan. Look, I got to admit, I'm no businessman, but I do know that Mark's walking a tightrope carrying a balance sheet that ain't balanced. Too bad his personal guard is ace you, the trickster. He loves leading you down strange paths. Mark's personal voodoo sect is about to morph into something closer to a sex cult. Mark Foster is on his way to die. He has convinced his number one follower, Greg Friesner, to be the hitman. In the past, Foster's voodoo schemes have all been spiritual symbolism. This time, it's for real. Foster believes his spirit needs to change bodies. He's figured out how to make that happen. He's got it all planned. The seeds of the bizarre tragedy that will end Foster's life are sown by a simple turn of fortune. He doesn't realize how fast yesterday's sensation becomes tomorrow's, where are they now? With technology, you've got to stay on your toes. His company is in trouble, and he just can't turn it around. CD-ROMs are getting better and better, but Quanta is just churning out the same old, same old. Mark just started yelling about how things were so disorganized and we needed to get priorities straight. Just kind of everything under the sun that he could think of off the top of his head. Mark had his company on the cutting edge. A head start, he's now squandering. There was kind of a window there where he could have reinvested in the company and tried to grow it. And I think he just continued to spend money. And then it got to the point where that window closed. He couldn't reinvest because he didn't have anything left to do that. Mark's not one to let business difficulties get in the way of his personal life. As the business sinks, wife number three walks out, but that's OK. It frees up Mark to explore another path, spiritual swinger. He discovers a form of Indian mysticism called Tantra. One branch of Tantra believes the mysteries of the universe can be explored through sex. <sighs> uh, Tantra is just a sexual religion that my dad was into for a while and taught classes at his house and stuff like that. Really, who could focus on business when beautiful young women keep ripping your clothes off. Tantric sex was another thing my uncle was involved in, where typically a man and a woman seek enlightenment through sexual prowess. You could find happiness and true love through the use of these different spiritual means. But honestly, the main draw was the uh, at first was just the sex. Women involved in this cult would do anything for you. They were used for their sexuality and pleasure. And that was a big draw to get people into the cult. They'll say, come on, come in, join up with us. Here, have her, or have her, or have these three. We'll talk to you when you're done. They had very low self-esteem and they felt accepted, they, they felt loved. And then my uncle would manipulate that into whatever he wanted. The ceremonies get wilder and wilder. It's demeaning to the vessels, but lots of fun for a young hedonist like Frank. 
the drums started going, and as we danced, uh, blackness just came across my body. I knew I was there, but I, was, I wasn't um, completely lucid of what was happening. And when I came to, I, I was completely naked, and so were these two other women. We were in a different state of mind. I know I had had sex with both of these women. This was a, a very intense ceremony. Well, I was told by my father that everybody in the house was sleeping together. I would say he was happy with this arrangement. In case you're wondering what any of this has to do with voodoo, the answer is nothing at all. The mixture of tantric sex and African gods is forced his own invention. He's woven a mishmash of beliefs into something I might as well call fosterism. It suits him just fine and the handful of followers who keep hanging around. By now, Mark's company, Quanta, is a far cry from the beacon of innovation Al Gore admired. The office is empty except for Foster and a giant stack of bills. He would be trying to scramble around doing everything himself, fill what little orders he had for UPS that day, and answer whatever phone calls he could answer. And you could just see in his face kind of the, the weight of the world. He was taking things very, very hard. He wasn't fun loving anymore. For so long, he could focus in on the fun and the generosity to people and ignore the reality of the life he was making, of the problems he was making. And now, everything was coming with a price tag. It was all these, you know, bills coming in, all these dollar signs telling him how much he had screwed up. I think that he, he felt like he had failed, and he just didn't have it in him to pick himself up and start over again. When the business collapsed, his income collapsed with it. Losing the cash cow was difficult on him. Not long afterwards, a relative finds Foster in a closet holding a gun. He ends up hospitalized for depression. It's a low point for sure, but you can't keep a smart, charismatic high priest down for long. When Mark Foster is released from the hospital, he's broke. He rents a few rooms on the wrong side of the tracks. He takes yet another wife, Sarah. Believe it or not, she's the sister of wife number three. Well, Sarah comes with some baggage, a kid and a hostile ex who wants custody. Mark believes voodoo spirits can help fix Sarah's custody battle. He sends a posse of followers to a cemetery to cast some evil spells. Myself and Greg had been asked to intervene in a magical sort of sense. The plan is to persuade the spirits to make something bad happen to take Sarah's ex out of the picture. So we brought what uh, could be termed vessels, people that could be used without consequences to ourselves, into a cemetery and did a ritual ceremony involving a sacrifice over um, a person's grave. Now, I'm told you have to be really careful when you call up dark spirits. They can turn on you. It's way safer to dupe somebody else into doing your dirty work. And we had these three initiates actually do it. Manipulation That's what it was. Selfish is another word. Selfish and evil. Make no mistake, to a believer, magic has power to help and harm. And Mark Foster has crossed a line here, using what he thinks is his influence in the spirit world to harm somebody. Up until now, you're not be far off and thinking of Foster as a fun-loving eccentric. But when you start trying to hurt people with your spiritual powers, well, there's a term for that, black magic. 
Santeria's dark side. After almost a decade, the party's over for sex cult priest and businessman Mark Foster. He's broke. Craig Friesner, Frank, and a couple of diehard vessels remain. With his back against the wall, Foster's quest for spiritual power takes a dark turn. There was some talk of, of sacrifice. They talked about finding a, a black girl and raping and murdering the girl and then burying the girl somewhere. Is Foster capable of murder? He wants his followers to believe he is. Remember how he symbolically killed that voodoo high priest to take on his powers? Foster tells them it wasn't symbolic at all. He really killed him. Although he had loved him, he had taken his life in order to assume a lineage of priesthood into his own body. If we were to divulge this to anybody, the same thing or worse would happen to us. There is no evidence any of that happened. I think it, it was part of his way of manipulating the younger men around him and to also create some fear. This is when the cult got really dark. Everybody was watching everybody, and it was a different atmosphere. It wasn't the fun party atmosphere that it had been. So Mark Foster has come to believe his black magic gives him power over life and death. Now, you and I consider death a certainty. Foster doesn't. But here's the rub. You know that old saying about life having two sure things? Mark Foster has no power over the other one. Oh, what was it again? Oh, yeah, taxes. He never paid his taxes. He uh, just ignored it. And the IRS was coming after him. He owed somewhere in the area of two to three million dollars in taxes. That's two or three million more than he has. And never paying your taxes? That's jail time. Not even evil spirits can stave off the IRS. Or can it? Foster comes up with a getaway plan. He buys life insurance and names wife Sarah, nephew Frank, and follower Greg as his beneficiaries. So what's his bright idea? It's simple but bizarre. He will get Greg to shoot him. Then Ashu can move his spirit into Greg's body. Oh, the IRS will never find him there. And the plan gets even more ingenious. The insurance money will make life comfortable for Sarah, the kids, and the reborn Foster. All his problems solved with just one little magic bullet. It's flat out crazy. Does Foster believe it? No one knows. But he does convince Frank and Greg. Foster said that it was his time to go. He's reached his spiritual capacity on Earth and his, his body is just useless here at this point, and that his soul now needs to enter into his highest disciple. Greg was supposed to take on Mark's identity, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. He was now supposed to be, in a sense, the man of Mark Foster's household. That was the intention for the money, was so that, you know, Greg could administer it accordingly for the children, for their futures, for the wife. It was a very convoluted story, but somehow my uncle was able to have it make sense. And we believed him. We all did. Like it was the morally correct thing to do. I don't know why he got caught up in it. It sounds, sounds ridiculous to me. To inherit the man's soul, it, it just, it, it's, too bizarre for me. July 17, 1997, the day before he is to die, Mark Foster sends wife Sarah away. Then he tapes a goodbye video for his kids to watch. The Africans believe that this life is a party, 
in order to go home, we have to get our party right, or at least we have to strive to get that party right. If we get the it was hard to watch because I could see the sadness in my dad's eyes. We celebrate life as we celebrate death. Death is nothing to be afraid of. Death is a great cross, crossroads, a change in attitude, a change in longitude, a change in the way that we perceive our spirit. When we reach that portal, they'll ring some golden bells. <laughs> He was depressed, and I saw a man who needed help and just couldn't, couldn't get it together enough to get help for himself to admit that he had a problem. And sometimes we may need to call on the help of what the Africans call the Rishans, the spirits. I asked him, is there anything else we can do? Do we have to do this? There's got to be another way. And he had said, well, there's two choices. We can go do this, and this will happen to me, or we'll take you, and we'll sacrifice you, and you can take my place. And then he said it was his destiny. He was master of the domain, and you didn't have a choice. Mark's plan requires him to treat his body to one last fling at earthly pleasure. There was a woman that came in, and she was considered a, a, a vessel to use before we did this. There was a number of different sexual acts performed with this woman, and then she left. My uncle was prepared um, for what was to happen next. When morning comes, Foster and his two loyal followers head out to meet their destinies. It's waiting for them on a dirt road, just across the Wisconsin border. The emotion was so intense. It's, it's hard to put into words. The, the, the feelings that I had to help end my uncle's life My uncle and Greg got out of the car. Well, Greg covered himself in kind of rubber clothes and had a gas mask on to avoid any blood splatter, as it were, which seemed to me to be just not fitting. If this is meant to be, why would you do that? My uncle grabbed his 44 caliber rifle, cocked it, put it in Greg's hand, and then pulled the barrel up against his chest. My uncle nodded, and Greg pulled the trigger. But it didn't fire. Mark Foster was a prankster. He was a trickster, and he tested Greg's courage, so to speak, and I think that maybe somewhere inside of him, he thought, oh, this is just another one of his uh, tests. So my uncle took the gun, made sure the bullet was chambered, handed it back. Mark's nephew, Frank, watches from the car. I don't know if he helped him squeeze the trigger or if Greg did it on his own, but there was a shot. My uncle fell over and uh, died. Mark was the trickster which raises a lot of questions, you know? Was this all a trick? 
was a trick on Greg. Instead of killing himself, you know, he needed some glorified way of doing it to sensationalize himself. And guess who has to pay for it? It's this young 24-year-old guy that really believed him. You know, I think it's sad. It's cowardly. Mark Foster's plan is that his soul will move into Greg Friesner's body. As far as we can tell, it doesn't work. Greg Friesner does not become Mark Foster. He becomes a criminal, a murderer. And thanks to his name on that insurance policy, in the eyes of the law, he's the worst kind, a killer for profit. When Greg came back to the car, we were both pretty devastated. He had told me that my uncle had said his last words were, no, it's not me. This isn't me. It's not happening. I'm crying, and then he realizes what he had done, and then he starts crying, and and it took a little while for us to stop. And from there, we went and disposed of any would-be evidence when we got back to my uncle's house, reported him as a missing person, which was per his instruction. A Methodist minister finds Mark's body and says a prayer for him. He was found and he was dead and he was shot. And um, we were just in shock. We, we just broke down. I was sad that the inevitable had happened. I thought Mark was really going to crash in some way. He was on this roller coaster ride and it had to come off the tracks at some point. Foster has one last trick, one final manipulation. During the autopsy, they found a note in his shoe that um, had the names of two men on there. One of the names is that of Sarah's ex, the one fighting for custody of his kid. It's an attempt to frame him as a murderer. It definitely turned into a wild goose uh, chase. Within days, they discovered there was something more, more bizarre uh, involved here. Foster, the trickster, planted all kinds of false clues to hoodwink the cops. Their confusion doesn't last long. Investigators discover Foster's farewell video and the insurance policy. Police suspect something odd's going on. And Angela, Mark Foster's daughter, is sure of it. She and her cult member cousin are close. Angela offers to wear a wire. The cops take her up on it. My cousin did say stuff that implicated himself, um, like they'll never find the gun and stuff like that, and said that my dad's death was like a party and um, like it was a celebration. It takes Frank quite a while to realize what he's done. About a year and a half after my uncle's death, that's when it dawned on me that I was involved with the, the actual murder of my uncle. I could have done something to stop it, but I didn't. And that's something I deal with every day. Police are sure it was Greg who killed Foster, but they can't prove it. Not until Frank confesses. I wanted to clear my conscience. And I felt that the only way to have a fresh start in life was to tell the truth. And I did. It was just time for everything to come out. Greg Friesner pleads guilty to second-degree homicide. He gets 20 years. Frank admits to being his accessory. He spends three years in the slammer. Greg said, you know, I knew it was a matter of time, um, but this is part of my path, this is part of my journey, and I'm ready to face it. And that he stands by what he did. He believes it was right. He believes that it was part of the journey. To this day, he speaks very, very highly of him. 
he truly believes that Mark Foster was an amazing man. I have said to Greg, what the hell were you thinking? Why, why would you do something like that? And he did not answer me. But I do know that he took another human being's life. And that's very wrong. But I love him. He's my son. I think there were a lot of different facets to Mark Foster, and I never can say that I knew who the real Mark was. I can say that I think he felt trapped in the end. Eventually, when I came to grips with reality, I felt that I had been taken advantage of by someone that I looked at like a father figure. But even bearing that in mind, I still have love for the man, and, and I hope he found peace. It speaks volumes about Mark Foster's power and charm that the two people his spirituality quest messed up most still love him. Foster really believed his black magic had power over death itself. He thought he had become as powerful as the spirits he worshipped. Crazy? Maybe. Egomaniac? Oh, that's for sure. And his ultimate manipulation was his most self-centered. His children are fatherless. His two closest followers went to jail. Mark Foster's god, Aishu, is known for leading his followers down the wrong path. But Aishu's not to blame. He's also the god of free will. Mark Foster made his own choices, and he dug his own grave. I forgave my cousin because I knew of my dad's involvement into his own death. And I knew that my cousin loved my dad and would do anything for my dad. When I look back on the time spent with my uncle, it was simply and purely a path of madness. And I got crazier and crazier and crazier until the madness finally ended, at least for some of us. <laughs>